Welcome to Artists of Note, another interview in our One Moon Studio series of interviews. Things look a little different today. I'm Sean Barrett, one of the co-founders and co-director of One Moon Studio, and with me is today's subject, who's normally asking all the questions, Mr. Andre Ferriante. Andre, welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Good. I'm doing well. Good. This is, this is yeah. a, a different switch for us. Normally, I'm on the back side of the camera watching you well, people. you know, um, I wanted to share a little concert with everybody, so right. um, uh, this will be fun. Yeah, you know? so we'll, yeah. we'll have that uh, video available at the same time that the interview video is available, so yeah. they can yeah. uh, pick what they want to listen to. And we heard a little bit of your music there at the beginning. That's beautiful. It's something you're working on. It's Yeah, I'm working on, I have a song that I wrote years ago called Garden of Desire. Okay. And I'm realizing that... Now I could kind of, I like the theme, but I want to write another section that is also tremolo. So hmm. I'm working on it a little bit. And, and when you were setting up, I thought, well, we're, why not just uh, test it out? See how Absolutely. It sounds, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, as you often do in your videos, I'm equally curious. Actually, we've known each other for, boy, almost five years now. For four years at least. Four, four years, About yeah. four years yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all started just like this, with that's me inter interviewing you that's at true. a coffee yeah. shop. Yeah, that's yeah. true, actually. We, yeah. were, uh, we were at Useless Bay Coffee. Yeah, and you were working for Whidbey Magazine. Whidbey Life Magazine. Yeah. We were writing yeah. a story for, about you, and that's still online. Oh, it's, nice. It's still up there, so okay. people can look for that. Sean okay. Barrett, and yeah. talking about this mysterious Italian musician that moved to the island recently and was bringing <laughs> his international flavor and... Yeah, and here we are, four years later, still working together on yeah, projects. Yeah, no, that's great. Which, which is great. So let's go back to the beginning, the very beginning. I, as, as I recall, before you were even playing guitar, you had this dream. Well, I've had, yeah, I had um, a couple of premonitions mm -hmm. about being a guitar player. Right. Uh, I'll tell you one of them, and very simple, and I, I can tell you the other one too, but um, before I played, I, so I started playing the guitar around 13, age 13, mm -hmm. but a couple of years before, I was about maybe 11, and I was at a summer camp mm -hmm. and with a friend, and we had just, just uh, two of us, we had been during a little break or something, we were out on a rowboat and uh, just kind of having fun in, in nature. And, you know, as kids do, the question came up as we're standing at the side of the water, what do you want to do when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And I and I haven't thought about the guitar, really, honestly, back then. But I just said it. I said, I think I'll be a guitar player. Just out of the blue. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I thought, I just said it. I thought, well, I think I want to be a guitar player. Um, so subconsciously, it was kind of it was kind of there, you know. And mm -hmm. I didn't think about it too much until, you know, a few years later, I started playing. That little memory became pretty important in, in the sense yeah. of like, what what kind of seeds maybe had been planted in in the past, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So you were about eleven. Yeah. And yeah. already, somehow. Just, just seeing it without even knowing it. So some sort of a destiny sort of a thing, maybe. But you mentioned also a dream that you had of you playing. Well, this wasn't a dream. Okay. This was a, another premonition mm. that happened once I had been playing already. So this is here. I'm 16. I'm in Rome. And at that point, I'd been playing for three years, but really deeply emerged in the the world of the guitar at that point okay. uh, studying with a, a great classical teacher studying flamenco hanging out with gypsy flamenco people just really playing mm -hmm. three or four hours a day really into You're the guitar. really in that world yeah. yeah so i'm 16 years old and um we lived in a little uh little village outside of rome called manciana and we lived in a little farmhouse and one night everybody's asleep i'm i'm a, i'm up watching a late movie um, and in the, the, it's a Brazilian movie and this beautiful um, scene in this movie with a guy sitting on a stool playing some music that I know that, I'm, that I've kind of worked on a little bit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and 
And it, at first I'm like, oh, wow, I, I've started to play that song. I like that song. And as I'm listening, and it's, you know, it's a nightclub, there's people, you know, eating and drinking, and there's just a, there's the water there, and it's just a beautiful Brazilian scene. I get chills, and I feel a sense of transference, and I feel like that's me. And it was a moment, like a transcendent kind of moment. Mm -hmm. So that happened. And I always thought about it, like that was an interesting moment, you know. Yeah, and it stuck with you. Yeah, so fast forward then, about... 15 years hmm. at that point I'm living in Seattle and um, maybe maybe 15 or 20 years um, and I had been playing at a very similar place in Seattle I played there for 12 and a half years five nights a week sitting on a stool oh, wow playing for people in a very similar setting mm -hmm. so when I was 16 I basically saw a little glimpse of my future Hmm. I saw myself sitting on a stool playing for people <laughs> that I did for 13 years, five and nights a week, you know. Were. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was an interesting moment that became more important once I started living that, you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How about that really struck you as, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like deja vu in a way. Yeah. So the guitar has the definitely been, been my life and mm -hmm. um, I... Uh, you know, I've, I've always loved, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I think when I was around that same age, I remember walking down the hall in a little, little farmhouse where we were feeling like, you know, I don't really have a choice. I'm going to be a guitar player. I'm going to be a musician. It's going to be my, yeah. my profession. It's in your blood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in a way it's kind of one of those things where, you know, many people I've known over the years that you know, don't when they're younger, especially don't really know what what's going to bring them happiness as far right. as work goes. Yeah. You know, and I've felt fortunate that I've. It's a, kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time because music is not an easy road. You know, no, it is not. Um, but at the same time, it's. Um, I'm uh, hopefully I'm giving my gift. You know, hopefully right. hopefully that's happening. You know, so. Yeah. Well, I think that is. I think that is. I think the number of people who adore your music and, and you as a man uh, is a testament to the work that you've been doing and the legacy that you're leaving behind. It's, it's really nice. Well, thank you. Well, thank well you. let's go back again, kind of the beginning. Um, you're not from around here. <laughs> well, yeah, I was born in Naples, born mm -hmm. in Naples, Italy. Um, we, um, my, my father... Uh, was was Italian and my, my mother from from here from mm -hmm. eastern Washington actually okay uh, so we would frequently every couple summers well maybe not that often actually every four years come to the United States you know All right. so from Rome to eastern eastern Washington and back and wow. forth <laughs> wow culture <laughs> but, shock but when I I was lived in Italy basically till I was 17 okay yeah yeah um, but I did get so the story of um, how I started playing um, I was um, 13 years old going to the overseas school of Rome mm -hmm. and one day uh, out of the blue the teachers like okay we're going to an assembly concert hmm. and so not even knowing what it was I just right. happened into this gym to the gym or the, the the large room where we had the uh, concerts I was sitting towards the back and it was a flamenco concert and it was a full flamenco concert. It was a, as they as they say a flamenco company. So you had the singer, the dancer, the percussion, and the guitar. Okay. And in that format, um, the singer is the main main person, mm -hmm. the, the the front person. And then the dancer, and then the guitar and the percussion are just uh, the guitar. In a way, is also the same as a percussion when it comes to the dancing. You know. Okay. But I remember the flamenco guitar. And uh, just kind of sweet, sad, nostalgic sound of the guitar when it was, you know, having the solo moments, just really mm -hmm. speaking to me as a kid. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, I, was, I was moved by it. And then I started, you know, taking a guitar class there at the school okay. with, and they, and they had um, a guy who taught like folk guitar, you know, this is, we're taught, this is like 19... 74 75 or something okay. like that you know um so they had a that was that my teacher was great he was 25 year old guy 
tall guy with really long hair and wore a top hat and ripped up jeans, and that was the music teacher, and his name was <laughs> Mr. Zimmerman. Wow. And uh, I remember he taught me Alice's Restaurant on the guitar, so not flamenco. Not you know? flamenco. <laughs> yeah, but then I um, ran into, uh, through some friends in the little town, uh, uh, the Manciana that I told you about, mm -hmm. um, a guy named Emilio, who was probably about the same age. He was more of a nomadic gypsy guy who played flamenco. Mm -hmm. And he would travel around Europe and spend, you know, maybe a month in Barcelona and then a month mm -hmm. in Florence and different parts of uh, Europe and come back when he needed money. And, and he, okay. he was always picking up uh, flamenco techniques from, from great players. So he himself wasn't a, a professional, but he was a, a pretty good player. So he taught me the first few things on the flamenco guitar, you know. Mm -hmm. And I actually, in, well, it's been a little while now. It's been about 10 years now, but I did go back to the town and played a concert about 10 years ago and and Emilio was there oh really and uh, still I was glad that he was still doing okay you know because he was basically yeah. kind of a a uh, little bit of a gypsy you know uh -huh. yeah and we had a dinner with some friends and played some music and oh that's wonderful yeah yeah but back to the story um, I um, I was recommended um, through some friends to, to talk to this um, classical player named uh, Enrique Rivas or Henry Rivas from mm -hmm. Colombia, Bogota, mm -hmm. Colombia. So I looked him up and I went and auditioned for him because he was a, mm -hmm. one of the most popular classical players in Rome okay. um, from yeah, Bogota, Bogota, Colombia. Auditioned to, uh, to... To study. To study with him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I went and played for him. And I didn't hear back from him for like a month. And I was thinking, mm. okay, well, this isn't, isn't going to oh. work. And then, and where we lived, actually, we didn't have our, a phone. Uh, we used the neighbor's phone, I remember. So okay. I remember one time the neighbor calling me, and um, I'd go downstairs, and it was Mr. Rivas, you know, and, and wow. I got accepted to study with him. Nice. So then my studies became more like studies. Yeah. Whereas with the, when, I was, when I was practicing the flamenco stuff with Emilio, I mean, he was... So I was doing homeschooling at the time. Mm -hmm. So I would be sitting there studying my math and English. And Emilio would, didn't always have a guitar. Mm. So he would come and knock on my window and want to borrow my guitar. So he'd sit down on the fence there by the garden and start playing this beautiful music. Uh -huh. And then, you know, I would have to stop studying. And I'd climb out the window and sit and hang out with him until my parents got wind. And then I had to... Right get back to my studies you know so that was that was how I studied the flamenco it was, which was that, that's how you that's how it is with the flamenco it's like t you know teaching from one person to the next showing mm -hmm. you how something's done as opposed to Hand reading music yeah right but I got very serious about the classical guitar with studying with Henry okay. and that kind of um, you know that was my course for for several years I got a chance to go to Bogota Colombia and uh, travel with him and he was playing concerts um, around uh, the Bogota area. They play, like for example, he's playing the the Concierto Daranjuez um, by Rodrigo, and he, so with the with the symphony. So he'd play um, for the kind of upper class at this beautiful theater, Teatro Colón, and then he played for the students at a college, and then we went to basically a very um, poor area and um, played in this um, kind of a stripped down version of a, of a little theater outside for um, the people that were a little more poor, you know, hmm, and we had nice. to watch the instruments and have people kind of guarding the instruments. And <laughs> but, but it was cool that they provided the music for everybody, you know. That is nice. Yeah. And then I played a couple of concerts and I also played on the radio the equivalent of like an NPR station. Mm -hmm. I played a full concert. Um, and um, I somehow, somewhere, that that um, cassette that I had of that got lost. I really regret it, oh. you know. Yeah, I had it up until like four or five years ago. I don't know. Um, so maybe it'll surface again. Maybe it'll show up in some storage or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope so. so 
<clears throat> so from there, basically, I ended up finding a teacher. I went back to the United States. I found a teacher uh, that was really originally from New York, but he was in Spokane, and he had studied with Segovia. Okay. And this is Leon Atkinson. And I'm about um, 19 years old, and I, I travel to uh, Spokane and to study with him at Whitworth College. And within a short period of time, he asked me if I want to be his assistant. Hmm. So I started uh, teaching uh, as his assistant, and then he quit. So, oh. so I ended up being the main teacher for four years at uh, oh Whitworth College and uh -huh. North Idaho College. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for several years there, the, the, and I, I toured around the Northwest, played a lot of concerts at other colleges where I knew teachers. And, and for, for well, that was like my classical era, you know, where I was, right. or season, or you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, where I was very, and, and during that time, I also got a chance to go and play for Segovia um, in the early 80s. And I uh, went to Madrid and played for Segovia in a master class. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and Leon helped you uh, set that up as well. I yeah, think. yeah. He had a he had a friend of his named Enrique Madriguera, um, who arranged these uh, classes with Segovia. Yeah. All right. So we went and studied with. Um, and that was uh, in, in Spain. In Spain, you Spain yeah. Spain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. First, we went to the Canary Islands, Tenerife, and oh, studied wow. with Segovia's assistant, whose name was Jose Tomas. Okay. And then. Uh, and then later in the in the uh, tour, we went to study with Segovia, which is, it was such an honor. I mean, he was 91 years old, I was 21. Mm -hmm. And I had met Segovia two times before mm -hmm. and had conversations with him. And so he knew I spoke Italian, so we had our lesson in Italian. Nice. And he was, um, unlike his early days where he was very strict and very fiery, he was more mellow at age 91, you know? Well, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> People relax with age a bit. Yeah. yeah. But it was a, it, I was, of course, very nervous. Oh, but gosh, once yeah. I sat down, I kind of felt like I was playing for my father. I just kind really? of flipped into this mode of, it, I could feel the love he had for the guitar and the love I had for the guitar. And I just felt like it was a, I, I, I felt like I was, I was so nervous, I just kind of got transported into some sort of other mode, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it all, it all worked out, you know, and I also played music that he loved that, that was written for him by Torba. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so he said you did okay? Yeah. Yeah. He did. Right, I, I, good. he, he was, um, ha very happy with my tone, my sound, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, also, uh, give me a compliment on my, a compliment on my interpretation of, of Spanish music. Nice. Um, so yeah, that was the the highlight of my my studying career for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so my, how old my, were you when you were were studying with Segovia? Uh, twenty one. Oh, twenty one. Yeah, okay. yeah. So then, um, fast forward then to my late twenties, and I moved to Seattle. Okay. And at that point, I it's kind of a life change. I had been married, and I got divorced, and. Because you were uh, you were living in Washington before that, right? Yeah. So in Eastern Washington. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, so basically a bit of a life change, divorce, and kind of um, starting to process as you do sometimes in your late twenties, early thirties, you know. And I I started um, kind of getting into more of the. I was a classical musician, but. At that in that season, I started getting into like what is what's it all about, you know, mm -hmm. creativity. What mm -hmm. is, you know, I had raised in a religious home, and I started having, you know, thoughts about expanding what my beliefs are spiritually mm -hmm. and artistically. So they all started to blend into one thing of just exploring, sure. and creativity was. Um, a big part of what was happening with my quest, my quest back then. So I started writing, writing poetry, mm -hmm. and then suddenly I started writing music, as as opposed to just playing all the classics that I played before. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, I've mainly played original music. Um, hmm. So start. We're talking, you know, basically the the early '90s now, um, and uh, gotten into writing poetry and and lyrics. And my philosophy 
of music now is kind of all flowers from that time. And um, as much as I love the classical world, um, I feel like I want to say something that is uniquely my own with right. music. And I want it to be a human thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't just want to deliver a perfect piece that's practiced from the classical repertoire, you know? Right. As much as I love that, mm -hmm. um, I like improvising. I, when I sit down to play a concert, I consider it to be like a conversation. So when I sit down to play for a group of people, um, I like to kind of um, feel out the vibe a little bit and see what, what feels right to play. You know what I mean? Right. For this group right now. Sure. So it's more conversational. I might start with an improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I have songs that I've written that I, that I play. But um, so, so my philosophy changed a little bit from, from mm -hmm. those early days. And it's still, it's still, it's still changing, you know. Do, do you think some of that, um, in a way, harkened back to the traveling musician that you started with? You know, because I'm sure he was a little more free flow. It was more about the emotion and. Yeah, know, I think it. some of that. I think also it's just it's my personality. I'm 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 more mm. casual, and I think as yeah. I'm, um, you know, allowing my personality to, um, you know, speak through my music. Mm -hmm. Um. That is what's coming natural. You know. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, people who haven't been on a stage don't realize that the musician feeds off the audience. It's a symbiotic relationship. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about in uh, engaging the room, right? When you're, you're, when you're improving and seeing how the audience reacts and, and all of that. Is it, has that kind of been your experience? Yeah, actually, you know, what's, you know what's interesting about performing is it is a little bit like a dream state. So I'm not yeah. consciously, I'm not consciously thinking about uh, the audience, mm -hmm. uh, and unless you know somebody's talking or something. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Yeah, there can be distractions, and um, don't do that when people are playing. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> no, my what I think uh, for me a, a, a performance that goes well is where I sit down and I stop thinking. Yeah. And I, I fall into the music and I fall into a place that is, um, it's hard to describe exactly what it is, but I right. fall into this beautiful place. And at the same time, the audience stops thinking and they also forget where they are. Mm -hmm. And when that works, and I can feel, I, I can feel it's a weird thing, but I can feel like in a crowd of like a hundred people or 200 people, I can feel pockets of people that are completely in their head and not at all surrendering to this moment. Right. They are um, completely in analytical mo mode, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's fine, but um, it's not my preference, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> but I can't dictate how people are going to listen to music, of course, you know? Well, for sure. Yeah. But... I, I would rather that people uh, switch into a mode of enjoyment and, and not, um, you know, 100% analyzing, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I, that's been my experience as a musician as well. You, uh, it, it isn't necessarily looking at the room and seeing what people are doing, though that is, that is a factor and it can be distracting. I've certainly had times when somebody's talking over here but but you see those people who are really into it yeah but it's energetic it's exactly, it's yeah. instinctual mm -hmm. you feel mm -hmm. it's like there's you know at the risk of sounding woo woo it's this weird energetic connection mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the people which i think connection that gets to your music and your writing um kind of you in general it's it's about connection isn't it yeah 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 for sure um you know I think it's, um, I've always been able to kind of narrow it down to one simple thing, and it sounds very simple, but it's just about being together. Yeah. It, it sounds really simple, but mm -hmm. it, it's about the gathering, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and 
uh, that one thing I always, I think I was, uh, who was I telling this? I, I, I tell this often to, to like young performers, but that are having stage fright, um, especially if you're doing a big show where you're, you know, um, having some nerves. Um, what I'll do back in the green room, instead of, um, you know, practicing a lot, playing scales and worrying about the songs, um, I basically do a little bit of a meditation and I think about what's really happening. What's really happening is not necessarily just about me. It's about the big picture, you know, mm -hmm. and it's about who is coming to the show. Yeah. So I, I just imagine this couple that lives in another little town. They've got kids. They haven't been out in a long time. They have a babysitter and maybe it's their anniversary. So they've gone to dinner and they are coming to the show. You know, and then I think about maybe this older guy that lives downtown and he doesn't have uh, too many people in his life and he's lonely and he wants to come and hear the music. So he's there. He's there by himself. Um, and maybe there's another couple that's on a date. Um, it was her idea. He doesn't really want to be there or vice versa. <laughs> right. Right. And, and those are things I can feel. Right. I can feel like when people are sitting there in the first the first couple songs, I can feel because you get intuitive when you play because playing is all about listening, and I've been listening for forty years. Yeah. So it if if you're a musician who is, um, you know, really listening to the music, you also learn how to listen energetically to people. You yeah. know. So in an audience like that, I can feel those things. And then, hope, and then later in the concert, if it all goes well, I can also feel that that person who doesn't want to, didn't want to be there in the beginning, I can feel that they're okay now. They, some, they liked right. something. Something, something, something that I played, they liked it and it, right. and it connected with them, you uh -huh. know. Um, but um, sometimes you get tomatoes, though, too, you know. So. <laughs> Well, then you can make spaghetti later. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all right. It's all right. So, yeah. So connection, being together. And you know, that, that is interesting, envisioning the people all coming together from these different places all over. And like you said, it's about being together. You know, even the, the one person who came by themselves will now, even if you're not talking to anyone, it's a shared experience. Music is so communal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think for classical music, you know, because I play classical style music, I think that needs to be really um, analyzed a little bit more because, mm -hmm. um, you know, there aren't as many younger people going to the symphony and you right. know it's it's not i'm not saying it's a, a dying art it's being preserved but at the same time um like for example you go to a rock concert right mm -hmm. everybody knows every song right. they love the band they all yeah. want to be there yes you go to the symphony seasons tickets right mm -hmm. and this is a little <clears throat> bit of a criticism but it's not the same vibe you have oh. People that sit down and they're all, you know, you know, waiting for the concert, and somebody will actually say, "So who are we hearing tonight?" <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because they just came from work and they have seasons tickets, but not sure who they're going to hear. And they haven't looked at the program. Yeah, yet. yeah. So it's, the passion isn't there always. Right. You know. Um, so it, it's a different mindset. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know when I've when I've been I've I've been to both rock concerts, country concerts, you know, festivals, and and to the symphony. And going to the symphony for me is something. I don't know. It's I've done it so seldom that it's a special occasion, but it's an elegance. Yeah. It's like tonight I'm going to have a fine wine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have a wonderful meal that I wouldn't normally have, and then there's this beautiful music. But it isn't. It isn't participatory. I don't feel like I'm, I, I feel it personally, but I don't share the experience with everyone else, whereas with something else you do. Now, sitting in a room with people listening to you play, you know, perhaps they're all drinking a glass of wine, they're relaxing, it's communal. You, 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 I feel the energy from the other people in the room too when I'm just listening to you play. And so that does happen. It is different, you're right. 
Yeah, and, and I think that also <clears throat> in the classical setting, of course, you know, it's it's I'm generalizing there a little bit, but well, sure. you can have sure. like a you know a famous famous person that everybody loves, and right. then it becomes a little bit more like a rock concert because everybody really loves this artist, you know. For um, sure. Yeah. You're right. Um, or they'll love a particular symphony, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.